it's gonna start the recording. Okay, very awesome. cool. Um, yeah, so I'll first explain uh, why I'm doing this. Um, so it is like kind of a course requirement that we reach out to experts in our industry, but I'm also doing this because I'm quite genuinely passionate about esports. Um, and at one point I did consider like a career path in it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just have a list of questions. Uh, I don't think we'll get through all of them, but but yeah. Um, so maybe first, uh, do you want to tell me about yourself and your involvement with esports and what you've done for the industry? Yeah, yeah. A uh, quick summary. Um, so I started running community events in 2013, 2012, uh, back in Auckland, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, started like a small community group called Oceanic Gaming. We ran like League of Legends tournaments and whatnot, um, streams, uh, internet cafe tournaments. And through that, uh, that was just because I was super passionate at the time. Um, and through that, kind of made connections with Riot Games and uh, people in the industry as well, just, just from running all those events. Um, uh, and a year and a half into running those community events, I was essentially doing it every weekend. Um, Riot actually opened a Sydney office. So um, thanks to that previous experience, I applied for a community uh, role and, and got in as a community specialist in 2000, I think 14, midway through. So I actually moved to Sydney midway through 2014, joined Riot Games as a community specialist, worked on a bunch of things. Um, most notably like uh, high school and, and university programs, cosplay and artist programs, um, really trying to help empower the community, um, essentially try to find more people like me and, and help them do more for League of Legends. Um, and, and, you know, some stuff on the game, like um, the Oceanic skin and, and uh, making sure our, our region had normal drop and things like that. So, uh, that was, yeah, that was kind of 2014, 2017, right? Game Sydney, um, worked on a bunch of projects. They, they actually recently uh, obviously closed their offices, yeah, as many yeah. people know. Um, but in 2000, late 2017, early 2018, I left Riot and uh, joined the Adelaide Football Club. They had owned a professional team, Legacy Esports, for a year and a bit. And they were essentially looking at the parallels between the esports team and the sports team. And they felt that there wasn't any like grassroots community programs in esports. It's all just teams mm -hmm. pro content, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they brought me on because of my previous experience as well to help them build out the grassroots scene, uh, starting with high school esports. So that's what I've been doing for the last three years, since 2018 till now. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of our fourth season in high school esports. And, and really, I just do everything in my power to make sure that's successful from, you know, making sure that the league and tournament runs and it all makes sense to make sure that schools and teachers are on board and, and also making sure that we have the funding we need um, from sponsors and publishers. So that's kind of the quick summary. Okay, yeah, that sounds really cool. It sounds to me that, you know, you're all about empowering the future of esports. And that's really good because um, my topic is actually exploring the future of esports. And so, you seem to have like a direction of where it's going. So um, I guess the first question I had was what would esports look like in 10 years time? In, in your 10 opinion? years time? Yeah, in 10 years uh, time. Yeah, uh, so esports specifically, I think in 10 years time, there's like, directly speaking, it's going to track hopefully very closely to sports. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is, um, in the same way that sports gets mainstream acceptance and support, hopefully esports will as well. So an example of that would be in the high school space that I'm working in right now. Um, right now, schools don't really uh, know or have facilities on campus to, to support esports players or esports training or anything like that. But every school has basketball courts and football fields and you know whatever it may be for sports. So in 10 years time, I'm expecting thousands of high schools across Australia and New Zealand to essentially have esports rooms. Um, and these esports facilities will be for training and programs development, but also they can double as a kind of 21st century skills and digital skills for you know, content creation, 
uh, programming, things like that. Because if you have a computer that can play games, you have a computer that can do all those things as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of like one big example, which is mm -hmm. just the mainstream support. Um, you know, we're talking high schools, we're talking local clubs, mm -hmm. um, we're talking universities. And then the next big thing will be government support. Um, there is there what support, sorry? I don't Government. Oh, government. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So if you look at a lot of the sporting bodies like Basketball Victoria or, mm -hmm. or Sports Australia, um, they get a ton of funding from uh, the government. So yeah. the, the, the peak sporting body for university here in Australia is called UD Sport. And I think they get like 40 to 50% of their uh, you know, income comes directly just from the government, from government support. That's so, crazy. So imagine what, what wouldn't be possible if they didn't have that. They wouldn't be able to run all the events they run for UD Sport, for all the sports they run, all the physical events they have. Mm -hmm. And then you, you flip that around and, and you think about, well, what would be possible in esports if we had that same level of kind of acceptance and support on the mainstream? Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, that's the, yeah, that's where I, I think I see it going. Um, the big, there are some question marks with esports though, right? Like the mm -hmm. digital sport nature. Um, will it be League of Legends in 10 years? Will it be PC mm -hmm. gaming in 10 years? Mm -hmm. um, or will there be some crazy AR... Um, brain controlled game uh, by yeah. that time <laughs> yeah i was gonna get to that a bit later actually but yeah, yeah. um definitely really cool because i actually played in hsl which you organized right yes um yeah i played in the finals so it was really cool and it definitely like your your efforts definitely helped like pique my interest um in league in esports and piqued my team's interest as well so it's really cool to see um it's good to hear yeah. Um. Just maybe a quick question: Is esports a sport, in your opinion? Uh. Yeah. I think for me, it's it's it does everything. Um. We want sports to do aside from the physical, right? Um. I think, you know, if 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 to you a sport is a physical activity that includes competition, then esports probably isn't, right? Mm -hmm. Um. But if you look at what makes sports special. Um, sometimes it's not about uh, the physical nature. It's, a, you know, if you look at the Olympics, it's about respect, you know, global language, sportsmanship, right? Um, and that's where I think uh, esports has all the same functions. Um, it can teach discipline, camaraderie, um, how to win, how to lose, everything that comes with competition mm -hmm. aside from the physical nature. So, yeah, to me it is. And I think, you know, League of Legends, CSGO, um, whatever new games dominate the space, Valorant maybe, right? Mm -hmm. I think these will be games that last for generations, um, just like just like sports do. And it's just it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, well, earlier you're also making like comparisons with traditional sports, like in terms of funding and all that. Do you see a world or do you think um, esports would ever overtake mainstream traditional sports? Um, so I think, uh, how do I say in a way, um, in a way it's, it's blurred, right? Because, uh, esports participation, uh, versus gaming, like gaming participation is very, a very hard line to draw mm -hmm. example for like, I'll use League of Legends or, for, you know, League of Legends as an example, the number of people that would consider themselves playing League of Legends at a competitive level is probably a very small minority uh, compared to the total player base. Whereas um, if you look at basketball, anyone that plays basketball calls themselves you know, a basketball player and, and might be included in those statistics. So, so I think first, it's a bit interesting in the esports world to understand like the differences between a player versus an esports player, if there is one. And then two, um, I actually don't think esports or sports uh, it's that kind of, I guess, discussion. It's more, I think what will happen in the next 10, 15 years is potentially something where it's a bit combined of the two, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think football, soccer, uh, basketball, they'll be around for, for decades to come and really popular. Uh, but I think, yeah, the next big sport will be, will have some digital component. Um, there'll be some augmented reality component or um some 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 technology component and and the main reason i think think and believe this is because 
and this this goes i guess a bit deep but like with sports there's a very high physical barrier to entry mm-hmm. you know before you can really start playing basketball the game you have to just be able to run up and down the court mm-hmm. longer and faster than the other team um i remember in high school i played a bit of basketball and a lot of what the coach would do was like hey just just do some laps around the court just run up and down back and forth fast because if you can run faster than the other team for longer, you're just going to score way more points at that level. Yep. It isn't until everyone is at the same level of fitness and athletic ability or similar, right? That's when you can really start playing the game of basketball, if that makes sense. That's when like actual basketball skills come into it because now you can all run the same speed for the same duration and now you actually have to outplay them. Um, and why I think digital uh, aspects will come into it is Primarily because if you think about esports, one of the biggest benefits is like it's way more inclusive than sports, right? Mm. Um, it doesn't matter how big you are, how tall you are, how short you are, whatever it might be. Uh, technically, you can compete on an even playing field. So, um, the, you, you know, I, I think the future most popular sport will be something that lowers the physical barrier to entry. Maybe mm-hmm. still maintaining some, maybe, maybe still maintaining some. Um, and then also, yeah, has some element of technology in it just because we can make better experiences if we include uh, technology in it. Mm, yeah. Let me have a think about that. Yeah. Then maybe let's just go deeper into that. What do you think some of these technologies are? I had a list um, which came with the question, do you see our increase in te- technology having an an effect on esports and things such as augmentation, automation, uh, the metaverse and virtual reality. Um, and there's like a lot more, right? So yeah. So maybe like, but what kind of things do you see actually have like a really big chance to influence esports in the say 10 years time? I, I think for me, the, the big thing that's missing in, in mm-hmm. I guess the next stage of technology, I, I don't think like AR or VR in its current state will do really anything meaningful for esports or sports. Um, and the reason for that is AR and VR right now are more like different monitors. Mm-hmm. It's just a different way to see things. Uh, what we need is a different way to Im- make inputs, right? Mouse and keyboard has been around for, I don't know how long. <laughs> um, and touch screens have been around for a while now. And you can see there are touch sport esports coming around. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, the next step will be, and there's two variations of this. One is like directly somehow plugging into the brain. So mm. instead of, you know, legal edges moving my mouse and clicking buttons, I'm just thinking complex things, complex mm. maneuvers, mm. complex moves to do. And then my character does that. Um, yeah. I think that that's the thing that will change um, sports and esports. Um, and then there's a variation of that that might come before, which is, there's there's people working on like an armband, a wristband, where it reads like your neural signals to your oh, fingers and hands, yeah. oh, yeah. and then based on the signals, you can actually just make your, uh, you know, make your computer or whatever do different things, um, because obviously the hand has the most nerve endings because it needs to do the most precise work for a human. Right. right. So, so to me, um, the key technology will be a new way to input. Mm-hmm. You know, put, mm-hmm. make input commands um it's been touch screen and keyboard and mice for a very long time or controller right for consoles mm-hmm. um those are the kind of the three big ones right now and mm-hmm. i think as soon as we unlock something that's a bit more sophisticated maybe you know maybe in, a, in an ideal world a bit more directly tied to the mind um that's when uh, a lot of things will change yeah wow that's yeah that's like quite fascinating to think about as well um what about in terms of like the spectator and like viewership perspective? How how would that look like? Because right yeah, now think... we yeah go on. Oh no, you, no, you finish. Oh, I was gonna say like right now we have these, or just like a two D screen with like League of Legends gameplay and like these stadiums of viewers watching and also a bunch of viewers on Twitch watching. Do you think that would change or evolve? Um, so I, I think there's two sides of the viewing experience, right? One is, yeah, right now it's 2D. And I, I mean, technically most sports is 2D as well, right? Really, really like most people watch it on a, on a TV screen or, or on some streaming service. Yeah. Um, 
So esports and sports very similar in that regard. In the future, um, I yeah, I assume there will be something different, uh, but it just depends, like how it adds value to the sports experience. Because in a way, um, you know, for sports, you just want to be able to see how the team plays, see the micro plays people make in terms mm-hmm. of footwork and uh, eye fakes and whatever, um, but also the macro plays in terms of how the team works how the team moves, how, how the team creates openings. So I don't know if there's a better way to see that nuance, right? Um, maybe maybe if there was some sort, maybe in the future one day, everyone will be able to have a replay feature or at any angle they want. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I, I assume there will be something different than just a 2D broadcast experience we have now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the flip side, you know, the key thing to touch on for esports is Right now, uh, when you watch sports, you inherently understand a lot of the game because it's all based on real life physics. You know how fast you can run, you know how fast you can jump, uh, high, how high you can jump, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So you know kind of how impressive some sports moves are, right? How coordinated they are, how athletic they are. Um, whereas when it comes to esports, it's like completely, it's not just not based on any real rules at all. Yeah, like if yeah. you look at League of Legends, it's just a whole new set of rules. There's no like nothing you know from uh, real life carries over really. Yeah. Um, so, so I think I think uh, uh, you know when we talk about uh, this, this touches back on your earlier question on will esports overtake sports in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, my my answer to that is related to this is that in the future I think the most successful sport as an entertainment will be something that. Um, is competitive, has fun extra elements that only digital technology can uh, introduce to the game. You know, like things like stats or abilities, like these these things that you couldn't have in the real world, right? But also, is uh, they find a way to tie in, I guess, real world elements so that it, it makes sense at a glance as well. You know, I think about mm-hmm. like Rocket League compared to League of Legends. Rocket League makes a ton more sense for a non esports player yeah. than League of Legends, right? League of Legends, yeah. you, you need to explain the whole time, like 100 different champions, 400 different abilities, uh, not a few hundred items, what all the stats mean, junk, every, every, every that, oh, it's all new. Yeah. Yeah. Rocket League, great esports game, um, based on real world physics. You know, a car is in the real world, you can kind of understand that, it flies through the air and it hits mm. the ball and then the ball moves in a predictable way based on physics. So, so I think, yeah, that, that's the biggest thing for esports, the viewing experience. As that becomes potentially more important, um, the, the the most popular one will be uh, ones that can combine the best of both worlds, which is uh, somehow easier to view, but also retaining as much as possible the fun aspects of you know abilities and items and levels and mm-hmm. new monsters and things like that. So that's that's probably yeah. Yeah. Um... Would you say then, because League of Legends kind of missed that, misses that, loses that quality of real world physics, do you see League of Legends kind of dying off? In the um, future? No, no. I think, I think you know, it's not as important. Um, mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, I think the most popular game in the future will be something that has the best of both worlds, but in saying that, right, if you look at basketball and soccer and um, American gridiron football, um, they actually have very complex rule sets. Well, gridiron specifically. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you look at um, American football, that rule set is actually pretty insane. I like. I don't. I don't actually know most of the rules. Um, mm. uh, but if a game is popular, then an, and, and enough people play the game, then enough people will know what they're watching, and, and that'll kind of circumvent that problem, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I think the biggest threat to League of Legends is not, is not like oh, it's too hard to watch. I don't think that'll ever be the the highest problem a game has. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do think the the biggest problem will be how do you adapt say say in a perfect world 10 years time we got like brain computer interface we can now directly make uh things happen with our brain and that opens up like it's different ways to 
make and play games, right? Um, it'll be a question of how does how does an esport keep up with technological change? I think that's the biggest mm, question. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think earlier you also mentioned how you don't see virtual reality in its current state, something that can really be applied in esports. Um, I'm just thinking, how would you see a world where virtual reality is like quite quite really de developed um quite realistic and everything would you see like yeah what's your opinion about that yeah so i, I you know I, I would love for vr to be uh much bigger than it is i think i think it's really cool it's just super early right it's right. uh most of the games are i mean it, there's there's so many things to work on I, I, the biggest thing for me is brain computer interface right yeah yeah so first and foremost like it's just hard to to make things happen in VR. Like mm -hmm. you got those two controllers, like you're kind of moving, but you're physically not moving. It's 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 just a bit of bit of a weird experience. So for, for VR, I think step one is brain computer interface. Mm -hmm. Um so that there are there are more compelling ways to control characters and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um they, they need to uh, the problem with VR is it's also so expensive, you know. Oh, mobile yeah. esports is massive because everyone already has a mobile. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, why touch yeah. controls are a thing now. It's so important. Touch mm -hmm. controls. Um, yeah, VR just needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of work mm. from a hardware and, and uh, input perspective. And then I think software will follow. The, you know, I have a, I think AR will be bigger than VR for a while. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I actually think VR won't be massive until until we have two-way uh, brain computer interfaces I, mm -hmm. I and this is this is getting very fringe science but mm -hmm. um but in the same way right now you're thinking okay i've got headset so i can hear and i've got the vr goggles on so i can feel like i'm fully immersed right I can mm -hmm. turn my head and things move um and then imagine a world where you then have a brain computer interface where you can input so now I can move my head to move. I can listen, and as I think, my character does stuff. Now I don't need like weird controllers and to do things right, with my hands. Yeah. Um, the, I, I, yeah, I have a thought where you know then there there could be a two way street instead of using your eyes and ears. If if a computer is already directly connected to your brain in some capacity, then you then it could actually just directly feed audio, visual, sensory to the brain. Uh, so you don't even have to like look through a screen or listen through earphones, right? Mm. Um, and potentially, potentially, it can uh, give a sense of like I guess dreaming, right? Like you're in a game and it's almost dreamlike. You can feel things, everything feels real, and you can control it. But but it's a game. Um, we'll see. <laughs> that's, that's that's fascinating. Uh, that's insane, insanely far away. So yeah, because in our design course, one of the things we explore is speculative design and I think brain computer interfaces kind of fall into that category. Um, so I actually don't know any, much about it. Is, it. is it like a real thing or is it kind of just science fiction right now? Uh, so so there's, I think primarily it's the two things. One is like, if you, Elon Musk has a company that works on one, which is called Neuralink. That one's trying to be like a direct brain Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wait, it, it, it already exists uh it's 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 not really like it's not uh, it's still just like research i would say uh, research okay. development phase yeah. um and and that one i think what how it will start is it'll first help people who have like alzheimer's or shaking re you know remove that stuff and then mm -hmm. eventually it'll get to a sophistication level where they can do maybe video games right mm -hmm. um so you know if you want to google it Neuralink is one and then I forget the I forget the name of this company, but um, I, Facebook bought them, um, and that's the wrist one. So it's like tapping into your brain signals, but through the wrist rather than directly in your brain. <laughs> um, mm. So so I'll you know I can find the link for you. I sent through. I think they're called Control Labs or something. Um, but those are the two current ways that people are thinking about how can we tap into brain signals to do inputs instead of mice and keyboard fingers and movements, yeah that's, right? that's that's Instead class fingers and arms let's just let's just take take it straight from the brain so mm. yeah those are the two main ways through the wrist and directly in the brain yeah damn well i i guess i had another question that was like what are the dangers of esports if there are any and um i guess that 
I guess like all this brain computer interface kind of falls into that because I c- can definitely imagine there being some like controversies around you know using our brain. So so yeah 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 yeah. What, what what do you think are some like dangers of the future of esports? Um, what you like? What what do you mean in, in a sense like? like can you give me a is there a comparison of sports that you think early there's sports there were dangers or what what do you think well, like are we talking well, economic well-being wise or everything i guess we can talk about everything mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so well, let's okay. just start with like economically um so i think in esports economically uh, one one big gra- one big um, not danger, but something people need to think about is um, how how does a how does a sport and esport work when someone owns the game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, soccer and basketball have been around for generations, mm-hmm. and even if the NBA didn't exist, basketball will continue to be around. Someone else will take up that mantle. But if Riot Games ever decides or falls apart or whatever it might be, and they can't do League of Legends anymore. Uh, league is gone. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's that's and and then when you're thinking about like Olympics or government institutions, schools and universities, et cetera, et cetera, um, building infrastructure around a sport like that, um, th- that's something that needs to be thought about. How mm. do you make sure it's there to last? It's there to stay. How do you pick the right game, the right publisher, and how do you make sure they, you know, you put all this investment into the game as a country. Um, how do you make sure the the, ga- the publisher, uh, I guess, treats that the right way, doesn't take advantage, and blah, blah, blah. So mm-hmm. that's something to think about, the unique relationship in the sense that there is a game developer involved. Mm-hmm. There's a publisher involved, right? Um, that's that's probably the biggest economic factor um, mm-hmm. to think about. Um, you know, and well-being, I think, on the well-being side, there's, there's two key things. One that I think most people, a lot of people have thought about, which is like, you know, the physical nature, right? How can we create uh, the right culture of playing so that people aren't don't become super sedentary? And I think this is a this is danger we are already seeing in the workplace. Obviously, everyone's working nine to five computer jobs, mm-hmm. uh, knowledge based work. So you're sitting in front of a computer all day, and people become sedentary. Um, so so I think that's something that's very important to think about. Mm-hmm. How can we help players? You know, you don't have to be an athlete, right? To, to yeah. play video games and most people don't need to be an athlete but how can you just be a fit and healthy um mm-hmm. even if esports is the main activity um and i think something that's less thought about is as to do with matchmaking oh uh, yeah uh, um and th- and this is more to, it, this uh it's like in sports to play a competitive basketball game you essentially have to go to the your nearest club or or court find five people play and if you want to play in a competitive game where the score counts and there are refs you need to pay to join a league and you're probably getting a bunch of your buddies to join up or you'll you'll make friends because you're playing with the same team for a long time mm-hmm. but in league that's not quite the case in most esports that's not going to be the case um people aren't going to pay to play in a league people aren't going to join a local tournament because solo queue already gives a very competitive very good experience on that yeah. front yeah. Um, but the danger of that is then how do we create, you know, a ton of the value of sports mm-hmm. is the social aspect, especially mm. in social leagues, um, uh, especially in social leagues, which is majority of players, right? Only very few players play at the top. Um, now the question is how can you recreate that experience in esports because mm-hmm. it's an important part of society. Yeah. Um, when everyone wants to play solo <laughs> because solo queue is a pretty good experience yeah. for the game. But a terrible experience um, for building camaraderie and meeting mm. people, right? Yeah. So, so I think that's something that that needs to be thought about more, and not many people think about it because it's not obvious. No one's thinking about matchmaking. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think I guess you 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 like build that bridge quite well with everything you do for like high school events, and I think you, I I read like one of the things you wrote on Twitter about like. LCS and how it can improve. You wrote like <laughs> think a thing on I that. Read that? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I read it. Yeah. Um, and you did kind of have a solution where where like high schools really 
oh no sorry esports was really integrated like into school and like the curriculum um so yeah so tell me like what what will that look like what would the whole system look like will it be like traditional sports where schools have teams and all that yeah yeah i think i think we need to find a bridge you know between this digital esports world mm-hmm. where we're unbounded by distance right um but but we want to find a way to continue to tie it to the real world to to tie it to your local community your local school mm-hmm. um because because uh anyway for the foreseeable future uh, both are going to be important your digital life and your physical life so we want to find ways for people to to find that balance between the two you know in an ideal world um i think if we had a robust government support and high school ecosystem right schools have facilities schools have teams schools have training schools have um small events you know athletics day but Maybe there's some esports in there as well, right? Um, I think in, in a world like that, that that's going to solve one big part of the puzzle in terms of building connection. You know, some of those players maybe they go on to be pro players, but most of them will be playing as a social sport for connection, for belonging. Um, and then the other important piece will be okay, how does this, so that's bringing the digital world into the physical world, right? So, mm-hmm. so we're bringing players and giving them great physical engagement opportunities in school events, school teams, school training, right? For the passion, for the digital passion. And then the next part will be thinking about, well, how do we bring the school to the digital? Is -hmm. there, is there a school guild? Uh, You know, should every game have a guild system where there there can be a school guild and it's verified and blah, blah, blah. How do you bring, um, yeah, the the social league to, Mm -hmm. to the, to the um, digital world. So it's, I think it's just finding the balance between those two. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's not solved right now, so mm. hard to say. We yeah. want to be able to keep the benefits of esports in the sense that it's borderless. You mm. can, someone in New Zealand can play with someone in Melbourne, not a problem. And, and most importantly, someone in regional towns, regional uh, Victoria or regional New Zealand, they can also compete at the same level as someone in the, met, in the city, which can't mm. be said for most sports, right? So once yeah. again, inclusive not only based on physicality, uh, height, strength, whatever it might be, but also inclusive based on distance or how far or close you are to city centers, which mm. can't be said for sports, right? So how can we retain that, but then bring in all the valuable pieces of what, what the physical sports have or s- schools have, which is that sense of belonging and community and accountability as well, right? Um, to, to digital world. So it's, yeah, that's, that's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a tough problem though. Wait, what do you mean by accountability? <laughs> well, uh, you know, the internet is anonymous. So uh, if, if you if you uh, behave a certain way, and we see this in our high school leagues, right? If a student mm-hmm. behaves a certain way just in the game, he mm-hmm. might get chat banned or banned at the game, mm-hmm. literally zero repercussions otherwise. Mm-hmm. Whereas we want to show people that you need to behave the right way, whether mm. you it's digital world or physical world because it have it has the same reper- it has the same repercussions for other people, right? Um, so, uh, if we want esports to be successful, to sh- to to espouse the values of camaraderie, like life skills, how to be a good person, right? Um, then we need to keep people accountable, everyone, players, um, so that if they behave the wrong way, there are, I guess, more uh, repercussions. It impacts your reputation, right? If you do something in the real world and you're an asshole, well, well people around you will know. Uh, people know who you are. If you're, you know, if if you go to certain school or you go to social certain basketball club or or league, and you're like always a bit of an asshole at that league, mm-hmm. people will stop playing with you. <laughs> like the, yeah. the local community will be like, well, we we actually don't want you in our games, and mm-hmm. you know that that's that accountability I'm talking about. Match make, you know, matchmaking kind of removes that because it puts you in a pool. You're one of a million players instead of one of 20. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that you still have the same impact on the 20 people you come across. Mm, yeah, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. Mm. Let me have a think. Yeah. 
yeah i think i think you talked about some really good points and how like in order for esports to to really become really integrated um we need to have these things where where you know there are like consequences in game also have real real world actions or real real real, real, real world consequences yeah. um yeah and it, and it, it's kind of both right it's like yeah. one you know, if you do something in the physical world, you know, you have a physical reputation, it's, it's affected. Mm-hmm. Um, if you do something in the di- digital world, right now it's a bit obfuscated, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, all the players kind of outsource it to the game. It's like, well, the, are you banned by the game or not? That, that, that's mm-hmm. all there is to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the future, I think what will happen is you'll also have a digital reputation as well. Mm. You know, your, your league and game name will eventually tie to whatever your internet person is. Mm. And if you're bad somewhere, it's going to have repercussions across the board. And that, that way it holds people more accountable in the same, you know, in the same way, if you, if you're a bit of a dick in um, basketball, you'll be held, held accountable elsewhere as well. Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. I guess, I feel like there's already a sense of that happening just from my personal experiences playing league. Cause like our, our region's quite known for having some pretty toxic players. Yeah. And like I feel like they've every time I see the name, they always just have that like lingering reputation yeah. about them. Yeah, I think I think what you're saying here mm-hmm. is probably at the higher levels where oh, there's yeah. less players, right? Mm-hmm. There's less mm-hmm. players and and it's a bit more of what I'm talking about, that local feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is like imagine at high tiers, there's only like say 200 players you interact with regularly so you come across the same person way more often yeah yeah around gold you, you almost never come across the right same person okay yeah but but if you think about sports mm-hmm. say even if you're a gold level sports player mm-hmm. because it's because there's a physical factor and you can only play against people around you you're mm-hmm. still you're, you're only interacting with the same players just like if as if you're a challenger in league right right so that reputation builds and that accountability holds now the question is how in a digital nature when in basketball, you're one of 50 players, even if you're gold. Uh, you can hold people accountable, right? There's social norms that are created. There's a there's an incentive to to be a good person because you interact with that same person again. So it makes sense to be a good person, right? Whereas in league at the gold level, they're almost the incentive isn't quite there because you never see those people again, really. Yeah, yeah. And by the time you see them again, you don't even remember you saw them in the first place. Um, so that that at that level. The question is, how can we add that le- that sense of, um, you know, accountability because mm-hmm. because you don't see those people again? How can we create a, an artificial environment mm. where you do where you do feel like you will and you should be a good person because, um, yeah, because it's it's still having the same impact, <laughs> just on different people every time, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it- but it does sound like a really hard problem to solve, though, trying to keep this integrity yeah. online. Because, like, yeah. a really big part of being online is your your animosity, right? You're an- anonymous. Um, yeah, you're anonymous. Yeah. I know that, yeah, like... I, I, yeah, go on. I was just going to say that that issue there mm-hmm. at the, you know, where I'm talking about the gold level, mm-hmm. um, where it's, like, you're one of 20,000, or yeah. whatever that number might be instead of one of 50 like your local mm-hmm. basketball league right um that problem that that issue well not issue that thing has multiple uh problems in the sense that one it uh and it might already be related but that that's where you're really losing the sense of belonging because mm-hmm. imagine imagine you're a gold player you play for five years you play, you play solo queue you're kind of hot stuck right yeah um and may, maybe some people just that's just where they are they're not going to invest further they play like a few couple games a day um it's not it's not like they're trying to be the best they're just playing it as a social league right Mm -hmm, it's just mm -hmm. a social thing for them Mm -hmm. um well because you're one of twenty thousand, you never come across the same people Mm -hmm. and what that means is you never build the sense of belonging Mm -hmm. the the community that you would if you played in the basketball league in the local social basketball league right Mm -hmm. um and then from there is where it spawns the issue of well, there there are those bad actors that aren't necessarily punished the same way they would be if it was a one of fifty, 
because mm. they never you never see them again and by the time you see them again you don't you forgot and then they do it again and you're like jesus i hate this person yeah <laughs> yeah sounds like sounds like quite a big big topic yeah this this one yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. this one's a big topic yeah 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 okay um well let me just go through the other questions i had mm -hmm. well i think i think you've answered all the questions i had okay so, great. so yeah i awesome. want to thank you for the time do you have anything to add or anything you think i missed no i, I think just just really to summarize like mm -hmm. the future of esports right Mm -hmm. um, gaming and esports continue to grow every new generation more and more of them play video games because mm -hmm. um, video games are more entertaining than yeah. just just uh, I guess stories right yeah. like just entertainment instead of watching a movie why not watch an interactive movie instead of reading a novel why not play an interactive novel mm. right instead of playing a just basketball why not play uh, a variation of basketball that's more inclusive and has all these things you couldn't do in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think more and more people play video games. Esports will continue to rise and grow in popularity. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a question of how does new technology influence that? Mm -hmm. And also how do game developers fit into the equation? Mm -hmm. And how do we take the best of esports, which is the inclusiveness? Uh, distance doesn't matter. Physical traits don't matter. Um, how do we keep all of that while also taking the best of what sports offers, right? Mm, Community, mm. belonging, social leagues. Um, so, so that's kind of, those are the questions we need to answer to, to determine the future of esports. Yeah, you sum, summarized that pretty well. Um, well, actually, I just had another question I remembered. Um, in, your, yeah. in your like Twitter post, I remember you said, you, you raised the question, is there a world where where there are cash incentives for being challenger? <laughs> um, this is like not, not really related anymore to like yeah. what we are talking about before, but what, what, what do you think for League of Legends? Do you think cash incentives is like a good thing? Um, I think there's a balance. I think there's mm -hmm. actually a, a very important balance. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you read and explore a little bit about motivation, mm -hmm. um, Sometimes what you'll find is people, if you introduce an external motivation, motivating factor, mm -hmm. people lose the internal motivation, mm -hmm. <laughs> motivating factor. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are studies done about this where like people play music for the fun of it and then they get paid to play a couple of times and then suddenly they don't enjoy playing without money involved anymore. They don't enjoy music anymore unless there's money involved. Uh, and, and that's something you have to be mindful of, right? But uh, I think... The reason why I said that was a uh, in Fortnite there are cash cups, which I think are a, a cool, um, a cool execution. Mm -hmm. But but most importantly, I think there's something you know. Once again, this touches back to one of the key differences between sports and esports is that solo queue was the best way to train and uh, get better and and kind of that that path to get noticed as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, historically, if you look at sports, it's like, well, I'll, I'll play for high school if I'm really good. I join mm -hmm. the club and I'll play in under 19s or whatever it might be, right? And then eventually I might play for like a state league and I'll start getting paid like a part time salary. Mm -hmm. um, but in esports, in a way, there doesn't need to be any of that. It's just solo queue. Bro, yep. So, so if solo queue replaces the state league or at the point at which you get paid, then we need to think about. How do you transfer? How do you, yeah? How do you make it that a feasible path for people, right? Mm, mm. Um, so, so that's kind of where it comes in for me. It's like it has two objectives. One is it does incentivize people to try a bit harder, or maybe even more people to give it a go, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, play for OQ, try get as good as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and then two, it, it it makes it a more feasible path economically. Mm. How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to, you know? Uh, yeah. eat live by yourself eat food whatever it might be um i think that you know that's something that's important to think about as well so mm -hmm. so yeah I, I think it's i don't think riot will do it 
I think mm -hmm. uh, there's probably a solution in there somewhere, mm -hmm. um, but it's only one one option, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, well, I guess like that that option kind of just really stood out to me. I, and yeah, I just wanted to hear more thought about it. Also, what do you think about like our current scene in in Oceania, on um, New Zealand and Australia? Um, because Riot Riot Sydney shut down. So do you see that as like the scene here is like dying? Uh, so you're talking about League of Legends specifically? Yeah, League of Legends specifically. No. Um, so I think I don't think it's dying. Mm -hmm. um, I think League of Legends is still a pretty popular game. Um, as you can see, I think what, here, here's the, I, I don't know, it's hard to answer, right? But yeah. League of Legends continues to top Twitch mm -hmm. and, and Australian New Zealand culture matches American culture relatively mm -hmm. closely. So as long as there are big American streamers playing it, I don't, you know, then therefore uh, it's going to be about the same size. In Australia, as 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 popular as as it stays popular on the global stage of Twitch, mm. especially in America. Mm. But what I will say is, I think League of Legends, while very popular, um, was destined to not be massive in Australia and New Zealand mm. Mm. and America. Um, Why I don't do you know say if that? You, I don't know if you can, so I don't know if you can change culture like naturally. I don't know why, but naturally, culturally. Call mm -hmm. of Duty has been the more most mainstream popular game, shooting mm -hmm. games, Battlefield, mm -hmm. Call of Duty. Um, people love armies, shooting guns here in the Western culture, America mm -hmm. and Australia. I don't know why, but that's mm -hmm. that's the way it is. Um, so the fact that League of Legends became pretty big during that time, when there was, you know, maybe CS:GO was also relatively big, right? Um, but there wasn't like a a massive alternative to. It wasn't the League of Legends of shooters, you know. Mm -hmm. what I mean? mm -hmm. um, um, and then CS:GO came out, and I think CS:GO and League of Legends player base were probably relatively similar in America and Australia. I think Call of Duty has more players than both those games in Australia <laughs> and America. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think long term, what will happen is League of Legends will sit at a nice niche. They'll be mm -hmm. stable. They'll have their niche. Um, I think it's a great game, and it's not going to die, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think games like whether it's CSGO or Valorant or Rainbow Six Siege or Call of Duty, if they get their act together, which I don't think they will because they're owned by Activision Blizzard. But, <laughs> yeah. but you know, CSGO, Valorant or Rainbow Six, I think they have, they're going to be the bigger games if you look purely at Australia and New Zealand, right? Th th mm -hmm. That's just because culturally everyone knows, uh, likes shooting games more. Maybe it's more intuitive. People know guns. People know point and click. It all <laughs> yeah. makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, maybe that, that's probably a part of it, but yeah, that's part of the culture here. So I think that's, yeah, I think that's what will be more popular. I don't think, I think it's really hard for a game to change culture. It, you, mm -hmm. If you, all your population likes the thrill of point and click, like headshot, like that thrill, that Twitch reflex, mm -hmm. yet it's hard to introduce a game like League, which is very cerebral, Mm -hmm. um, map, vision control, distance, resource mm -hmm. control. Uh, it's like really a form of RTS, right? Yeah. Um, the population isn't going to suddenly be like, actually, RTS is really great. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. want Twitch headshot, boom, adrenaline moments. I want a methodical, methodical fog of war strategy game. No, mm. no. So, so I think I think League has a is going to be niche. Um, but you know, a country can support multiple sports, so I don't think it's a problem. Yeah, um, I've yeah I've definitely heard about this before. The cultural differences where, like, in the West, it's more like, after, like I just want to shoot things and relax. And then <laughs> in more Asian countries, it's like, like big braining, um, more strategic kind of games. So yeah, there's definitely that like cultural shift there, which is quite fascinating in itself. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned like. You, you sounded pretty confident when you said League of Legends is still going to be around in the long term and it won't really die in esports. Um, yeah, just curious why you think that and what kind of qualities that League of Legends has that will make it last really long. Because I know that, like, what's the game called? StarCraft, was it? It was, yep. like, it was like a really popular esports for, like, maybe, like, 20-plus years, but it's, like, pretty dead now. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I think, so first of all, in Australia and New Zealand, right? Mm -hmm. I think as long as League of Legends globally is around, there will mm -hmm. be a scene for it here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing, but, but let's talk about the game. So, mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is where uh, game, the game design comes into it. You need to, you know, people need to think more about why so many people stayed, why people play it for 10 plus years. I played it for 10, I'm, I'm playing Wild Rift these days. It's, uh, it's similar. Mm -hmm. but uh it's faster which which suits me better right mm -hmm. um but it's still like the same game it feels the same if that mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. um so so here's the reason why i think league of legends is here for the long term and it's mm -hmm. primarily because the game itself is is like just spectacular so um it's because there are it's it's a multi-layered game that that's the that's the biggest thing it's um at, at the, you know, in the early game lane phase, right, you have the 1v1, the the micro kind of skill matchup. Hitting skill shots, dodging skill shots, a little bit of that twitch reflex that we talked about for shooting, right? That a lot of, a little bit of that's present. Um, and then you, you enter the mid game and there's this extra layer of like teamwork, uh, skirmishing, all right, and then you start to you start to kind of get some semblance of like, oh, there's distance to this map, and I need to move around the right way and be in the right place at the right time. And then late game is all about um, being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, it's it's about fog of war. It's about mm -hmm. um, finding opportunities to get a numbers advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and once you get to that level of gameplay, it's mm -hmm. I mean I don't know if you've read the Art of War, but it's like fully it, applicable. Right. I it's see. fully applicable. Uh, the mm -hmm. Out of War talks about like um, kind of attacking supply lines or like mm. pretending you're being gonna go somewhere but doing something else, right? Mind games um, at a at a at a country level. <laughs> you yeah. know, using distance to your advantage, mm -hmm. pretending you're gonna attack one side but attacking the other side, right? A lot of these um, things that are only possible if your game has fog of war and distance. Mm -hmm. um and that and league of legends has both those things mm -hmm. um so there's the, it's like a multi-layered game where you get twitch reflexes you get to have your outplay you get to have your you know fighting game mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. um but then you get to have the strategy game feel as well it's got both of those things um and that's what makes league of legends special mm -hmm. uh whereas if you look at you know some other games they they only have uh the fighting like there was a game called battle right oh yeah i've played it before yeah which was pretty much just team fighting or or lane phase 3v3 2v2 um and the reason in my opinion that doesn't stick even though it has pretty much the same mechanics as league like from a champion level right yeah like yeah. there's outplays the skill shots but there's not there's no strategy <laughs> yeah you know yeah. Yes, you, you lose so that's that's the missing that's the missing bit and uh, i'll just mm. touch on a little bit on like uh, the shooters and, and fighting mm -hmm. games in this relation as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of those games, a lot of these games, they need you need to be able to have multi layered approach, um, mind game. You need mm -hmm. to have mind games essentially, mm -hmm. um, and it's the same in sports actually. But if you think about a fighting game, uh, you need to be able to do all the combos. You need to be able to you know execute. But at the end of the day, it's about hey, I'm gonna do you know the best play is this play. The best players to do a high high kick. I don't know <laughs> fighting mm -hmm. games. The best players to do you know an uppercut. Um, but we both know that. So then your response to an uppercut should be this. But what if I do a move that your response would be bad against? And mm. now I surprised you, right? Mm. Uh, that, and that only works when everyone knows what's meant to happen, mm. right? Um, and yeah. a game needs that. A game needs that. It's the same in shooters. It's like it's a shooting game is actually at a high level. It's about yes headshot right twitch reflexes or anticipation even mm -hmm. but it's actually about like okay information gathering how many people are on what side of the map should we should we smoke this area to deny some information and then go another way whatever it might be there's mm -hmm. that multi-layered approach and yeah even in basketball if you get past the physical nature it's like well we're best at this so they defend us like this and then how do we counter that and it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of all mind games yeah 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 that that answers it pretty well. You need that like that mind game in order for it to 
take on the next step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Without the mind games, it becomes very uh, methodical. Yeah. It's it's just like kind of doing the same thing. Skill based, solely skill based. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, That was pretty good. I think I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, So I'm super grateful for this, for for you spending almost a whole hour sharing with (laughs) you about this. Not a problem. I don't know how to stop the recording. Oh, I don't know. I don't.